as you've just heard, I'm a philosopher and a linguist, and in my research I'm trying to combine philosophy and linguistics, looking at time, time in the mind, time in language, time in conversation. And uh, um, today I'm going to talk about human time uh, as we experience it and we, as we uh, hold beliefs about it, as well uh, as a little bit about real time, so the metaphysics of time, um, and try to combine them in in one talk. When you look at any good work of fiction, you'll see that there are plenty of uh, deep, profound um, thoughts uh, about time. Here is just one, Dostoevsky, uh, The Devils. Uh, when all mankind achieves happiness, there will be no more time, for there won't be any need for it, a very true thought. Where will it be hidden? It will not be hidden anywhere. Time is not an object, but an idea. It will be extinguished in the mind. So that's just one idea we hold the time is our time, psychological uh, time. But what perplexes philosophers most is the flow of time. How is it that we feel that time flies? And how is it that we have our own uh, feeling of this flow, which can be different from the objective measurement? So here are again some examples. Henry Miller, the day is moving along a fine tempo. Uh, and Martin Amis, sometimes I feel that Life is passing me by, not slowly either, but with ropes of steam and sparks, pattered wheels, and a hoarse roar of power or terror, and so on. Um, on the other hand, when you look at uh, contemporary physics and dating back uh, to, uh, to Einstein, here I quote uh, from his popular book on relativity, which was translated into English almost exactly 100 years ago, 1920, we see that time is simply a dependent variable of space-time. So we have four-dimensional reality or multi-dimensional reality, uh, but time is a dependent variable. I quote here, the world of physical phenomena is naturally four-dimensional in the space-time sense, uh, for it is composed of individual events, each of which is described by four numbers, namely three space coordinates x, y, z, and a time coordinate, the time value t. So time, uh, understood as such, simply doesn't uh, flow. So my questions are, can the human concept of time be reconciled with real time? of space-time, and then how do the concepts of the past, the present, the future, and the flow uh, of uh, time fit in? And if can be, it can be reconciled, then how? Because, of course, we could start with the assumption that it's all time, so let's try to reconcile, like uh, uh, philosophers uh, often do. They start with an assumption. In other words, again, uh, my uh, questions are, what does it mean for human time to flow? And then I'm going to move between the metaphysics of time, wearing my philosopher's hat, so the reality of time as uh, uh, we understand it, and uh, wearing my ling linguist's hat, the concept of time as expressed in speaking about the location in time. By location, I mean the past, the present, the future, or yesterday, tomorrow, and so on. Uh, and the flow of time uh, in different languages, because it's really interesting to look what different languages do uh, with uh, time. So, first of all, time can mean many different things. Uh, when philosophers talk about time, uh, I call it metaphysical time, then they mean the ontology of time, the nature of metaphysical time. In other words, they would say that time is something we uh, predicate, we say, about the world, about reality. Not uh, uh, Then, when we look at psychology, I call it epistemological time, then time means the human concept of time, so our, our time. And then time in language will be temporal reference in natural language. So in language, we'll talk about time, how it is expressed uh, through uh, adverbials, yesterday, tomorrow, or tenses, uh, simple present, and so on. And analogously, tense. Tense. This is even, uh, even less known that philosophers talk about tensed reality. So reality is either tensed or not tensed. Here there is a division um, in, uh, in the field. Some claim that the past, the present, and the future are real. Others uh, are more oriented towards uh, natural sciences and claim that uh, reality is not tensed. Then we have tense uh, in our thoughts because thoughts distinguish between the past, the present, and the 
the future, so we have epistemological time. And finally, uh, what we all used to as learners of languages, tense in language. So linguistic tense, systematic grammatical marking, normally on the verb, but not always, uh, of temporal distinctions in a natural language. And in my work and in my talk today, I start with the assumption of commensurability of these three domains, namely that we can actually talk about them together in the same research project and in the same talk. It is all time, in other words. Uh, I've written a little bit about that, so a bit of self-promotion representing time, uh, and uh, then a follow-up, uh, an article here. Uh, and I'm going to summarize with the speed of light now what I think about time and human time. So first of all, when you think about how we speak about time, just let's uh, take the language we are all speaking here today, English language. We can refer to the past in many different ways. I can say, I read War and Peace, that's regular past. Or we can use so-called vivid present. This is what happened yesterday. I'm reading and suddenly the door opens. Oh, I could use all sorts of model forms. I would have finished, I must have been reading, I may have been reading, I might have been reading. So all these different forms refer to the past, which makes me think that really what's at stake here is the past and ego and the self, the, some kind of degree of commitment with which I speak about these events, states, uh, as, as an experiencer, as a speaker. So in other words, uh, we have we can uh, show it diagrammatically as the degree of epistemic commitment, commitment in our thoughts uh, to the events we are talking about when we use regular past, such as I went to Krakow last year, then the degree will be high. Uh, when I use epistemic possibility, I might have gone, but I don't remember, then it will be somewhere uh, here much lower. And we can do the same with the present. Um, I, you can say about me, Kasia is speaking now. My husband can look at his watch at home and think, oh, Kasia will be speaking now. So will can be used for the present. Uh, you can use model for must be speaking, may be speaking, might be speaking. So again, we have these different degrees to which we commit ourselves to this present uh, event. Uh, again, regular now is high, uh, might be speaking is somewhere low. Um, and predictably, we can do the same with the future. The future is the easiest because the future is unknown. So it's very, uh, very uh, likely and normal that we'll be using these forms. But if you look at that, if something is pre-planned in your diary, uh, then you use uh, a strong form. So I look at my diary and I say, I go to Krakow next week. Uh, you can say, I'm going to go, I'm going, uh, I will go, or Kasia must be going, maybe going, might be going or might go. So again, we have different degrees of commitment. Or here I flipped it into the detachment. If I say I might be going, I detach myself to a greater degree from uh, what, from the eventuality. Uh, if I say I go, then this is certain. So again, here the focusing, the focus is on the ego, on the self, and on the commitment to the events rather than anything else uh, in uh, time. So this is what made me think that perhaps we could we could explain time by looking at this commitment, looking at this modality. And this is what philosophers uh, call supervenience here. Supervenience means dependence in the sense of definitional characteristics. So temporal properties supervene on modal properties if no two things can differ with respect to temporal without differing with respect to modal. So you look at these differences in commitment and you, you get some clue as to what time uh, is, at least what human uh, time is. In other words, here, human time can be defined using the ego-centered degree of commitment uh, to uh, events. Um, now, the problem is that we can't really use uh, linguistic expressions rely completely reliably because the linguistic tense is not a reliable guide to the psychological epistemic tense. Uh, as you could see, I could use the future. Uh, Kasia will be speaking now to talk about the present. I can use the present for speaking about the past. So we need a little bit more. Uh, and also, when you 
look at languages which don't make this freeway distinction between the past, the present, and the future, you can see that we can go part of the way, but we, have to, we need some other information as well. So here's an example from Slatham Hedge, uh, a language uh, spoken in British Columbia, which makes only the distinction uh, between future and non-future. So this means I was or am hungry. When you add kel, you get I will be hungry. So there is nothing in the linguistic expression which will tell you whether it already happened or is uh, happening. In Thai, Mary Wright novel, uh, where uh, tense and aspect are both optional. They are there, grammatical tense, but they are optional. You don't have to use them. You can use a form like that. It can mean anything from wrote to uh, will be writing, and you just look for some default interpretations in context, or just even context-free defaults. That's taken from a work by my former PhD student. Um, now, there are also lots of tenseless languages. These are really fascinating. Tenseless languages where you have no grammatical marking of time. Yucatec Maya spoken in Central America, Mandarin Chinese, and plenty of others. So Yucatec Maya, for example, has markers which convey information about whether something is finished, in progress, uh, prospective, uh, necessary, uh, or wanted, needed, and so on. So all these features, which again focus on the self, on the person, rather than this location in time or time flow. So they are fascinating because they give us another pool of um, evidence that there is really something more to time than just uh, the location on an axis or sometimes in a circle in certain cultures, uh, and the uh, flow. Here's one example from Yucatec Mayan. Um, a prospective um, aspect, uh, so going to prospect. Uh, uh, I read newspaper, which can mean I am going to read, I was going to read, or I will be in a state of wanting, of wanting to read. Um, so what is in the grammar in that language is really about the degree of remoteness from me rather than about a point or some interval on the uh, axis um, uh, of uh, time. Um, this, is, this sums up what I've just said. The degree of remoteness is foregrounded, not the past, the present, uh, or the future. So time is really detachment from certainty, even concerning the present. Now, this slide, uh, I'm not going to explain it. This is just to show you that in formal linguistics, we are interested in theories, theories of meaning which give you some predictability. So um, when you have a theory of meaning, uh, of of temporality, for example, you want to be, be able to create formal representations, uh, which you can then do for any sentence of any language, any sentence never heard before. So this is how I do it in my theory, so-called default semantics, which was mentioned in my introduction where I put, uh, this stands for conceptual representation, uh, and I put uh, uh, here chunks uh, of information, uh, after which I put the source of information or a process, and it all builds together compositionally into the meaning, and this is how I represent time. But as I said, this is just to show you visually, aesthetically, what it looks like. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, the idea is that there is a, a representation of meaning in the the mind, uh, which combines information uh, from our uh, world knowledge, so encyclopedic knowledge, from the sentence and from the context and from some stereotypes, defaults, as well as in inferential system, the way how human brain works. So the human mental architecture, mental processes will give you one way uh, uh, to um, produce meaning and uh, aliens would give you another. Uh, that translates into types of process Processes, which again, when we process an utterance, they combine to give you that sigma I showed you before. So that's wearing my linguist's hat doing formal semantic representations, which uh, again I presented in my uh, theory of default semantics, and that's the latest. Okay. Um, so, now back to uh, the question of uh, time meaning three different things. Remember my first slide, uh, where I talk about time in reality, in 
uh, our thoughts as well as in language. What I really want to do here is arrive at some kind of explanation of what time is by looking at these three domains uh, together. These are my three uh, domains, just to repeat. And because, as you may remember, I uh, pointed out that what's important for the human concept of time and for the expressions of time in languages is this degree of commitment or alternatively the detachment with which uh, we speak about events and states, then I try to look for this, which, I, which is called modality in each domain. So we have language, time L, semantic modality, might, uh, may uh, and so on, uh, or lack of it, uh, which is certainty, but conceptually it's also modal modality. If you don't have detachment, if you have certainty, it's conceptually also modality. Then we go to epistemic psychological time, uh, we have epistemic modality, and finally uh, metaphysical modality here. So you can uh, reduce conceptually time this way by going along that uh, bottom uh, line. The task is, of course, to propose the correlates, the units uh, which you will be comparing with uh, one another. So in the linguistic domain, uh, I have this epistemic commitment, which I represent formally uh, as an operator of acceptability uh, uh, to a certain degree uh, of uh, some proposition, which is uh, this conceptual representation. In the uh, domain of our thoughts, uh, we have the corresponding values on the scale for weekly believing, I might go to Krakow, uh, to knowledge, um, uh, I am going to Krakow, or I did go to Krakow, uh, so that's uh, here it is fairly straightforward. Then it is of course harder to move from there to metaphysical time. Uh, here people do it in different ways, you could, uh, you could do it um, from linearity and co-directionality, that is anthropic principle, we live in the kind of uh, universe in which uh, humans can live because uh, uh, of uh, the increasing uh, disorder uh, of the world, second uh, uh, law of thermodynamics, or you can do, do it simply from these parallel model uh, reductions. Or in simple words, just as we are committed to propositions, to meanings, to a certain degree, because we are committed to events to a certain degree on a scale from weakly believing to strong knowing, for example, knowing that I am here now. So events and states can or must, in the sense of metaphysical modality, take place. So again, we have these, these degrees of detachment or commitment on the level of real world. Okay, so that's my first part about what time is in these three domains and how we can uh, have a reductionist account, how we can talk about these three domains um, uh, in uh, one uh, conceptual frame. Now the passing of time. Passing of time is something which, which excites philosophers very much, the feeling of the passage. I'm more interested in the concept of the passage than, than the feeling. Um, and here what is, what is important is that we seem to feel that time really passes, but that the rate is how we feel about this passage. So we have the concept of some ob more objective time and subjective time. Now directions of this passage, how they are depicted in our mind vary. Um, there have been experiments done uh, on uh, how people conceptualize time in different cultures, left to right, right to left, um, and uh, vertically or cyclical, that varies, but it's not so so, uh, so important. Um, what is important is what is this flow of time? How can we explain it? I'm not, I don't even hope to give you the, the final answer in this talk. People have been um, wondering about it uh, from um, ancient philosophy onwards. Here are some big names on top. Here are some contemporary names in uh, philosophy. And essentially there are two paths here. Either you say that there is dissonance between the metaphysical time, the real time, that doesn't pass, and the psychological time that does, so they are essentially different, 
or we dissociate passage of time as change from flow. So we say that there is a passage of time that is change, but that doesn't mean that time flows. So there are these two options open uh, to philosophers. <coughs> But it is possible that this dissonance is only apparent, that it's actually even simpler than, uh, than that. Th that. Um, now, when I started thinking about it, I started wondering to what extent can we lay people, non-physicists, here I talk about those of us here who are not <coughs> physicists, astrophysicists, and uh, uh, have only uh, popular understanding uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, physics, um, to what extent do we understand uh, terms such as uh, time is the dimension? To what extent do we understand what uh, the, um, uh, theory, the special theory of relativity uh, tells us. And it seems to me that this, well, it's clear that this awareness increases. As I said, we are 100 years after the publication of the, even of the, of the translation into English of Einstein's popular and beautiful popular book. Um, uh, if you haven't read it, I re really recommend it. It's a tiny, thin book called Relativity, and it's really, really, uh, well, mostly clear. Um, here we have this increasing awareness of Einstein's special theory of relativity progressing with time. Um, we also know that we don't observe any absolute direction of time flow. We know it. Neither do we observe any absolute rate of this flow. This is not what we observe. Directions such as the past is behind us, the future is ahead, uh, are relative, are culturally imprinted. We don't, we don't really think that they are real. We also know that the rate is the feeling that's clearly subjective. When you uh, wait uh, for your dental appointment, then time will uh, flow uh, very slowly. When you're enjoying yourself, it just simply flies. So uh, we know that. This is something we do know. We also know that we have this perspective of the ego on uh, time. So some philosophers sum it up as this functionalist explanation. Here, uh, mainly um, uh, Simon Prosser. It is the ego that changes, and at the same time, ego endures. Endures is extended in time from birth to death, persists through time, uh, and uh, constitutes a construct without which moral laws uh, and uh, uh, other important ideas like, uh, like causation, cause-effect relation, uh, could not be proposed. So it's our perspective on reality that gives us that. Now, this is what Simon Prosser, a British philosopher uh, from uh, University of St. Andrews, uh, calls computational economy. I quote here, computational economy is, I suggest, the chief reason why objects are represented as enduring rather than perduring, enduring extended in time rather than being stages, stages of me at different times. Um, it is more economical to represent a simple enduring entity from birth to death than perduring, so me, different me's at different stages in time, um, um, that consists in the unity of a series of independently represented parts. So I'm not just a unity of different, different me's, I uh, and my consciousness are one from uh, birth to death, but that's our perspective because this is more economical to think about humans in uh, that way. Some, but there are some who prefer this stage view, that we are stages. So this is how I look at it now. Firstly, I believe that time doesn't really pass. It's a dimension of space-time. I trust that this is, this is what current state of physics tells us, and that must be right. So from the percolation of, the, of modern physics of space-time to popular knowledge, which is about 100 years old, about that, we get there. That we don't understand it fully, but we understand it uh, as, uh, uh, as communities. We understand it to a degree. 
Then, I believe human time passes for us humans and know that this passage can be objectively measured. We can uh, listen to the radio, look at the corner of the computer screen, we know uh, that uh, there is objective measurement uh, of time. So we know it from representing our experience, here are some names as well. Uh, also, we know it from the finiteness of our life. We know we were born and we will die. So here Martin Heidegger talked about it a lot. Um, we know it, uh, the measurement we know from experience, from our watches and so on. And C, I also know that the objective measurement of human time can differ from the gauge duration reported by the experiencing subject. So emotions can interfere, uh, or perspective, if you look something in a smaller and a smaller scale, then time seems to be shorter, or there's been, or there's been all sorts of experimentation on that. So we know that there is subjectivity there. This is, uh, Michael Flaherty is interesting here. He says, um, we perceive the passage of time as protracted, so longer than real, when the density of experience uh, per temporal unit is high. So when you go on holiday, a lot happens in a day. Uh, you may wonder at the end of the day, has it only been one day? So much has happened, feels like a week. Um, uh, then we perceive the passage as synchronicity when the density is standard, and we perceive it as compression when the density is low. So when you don't do much, when you sit at home, uh, you are ill or you are elderly, then time just uh, passes by uh, and you wonder where has it gone? It's, has it really been a year since last Christmas and so on? So there are these different um, reasons. This is one, the density of experience. Emotions will be another. Uh, perspective will be yet another for this uh, subjectivity. So the outcome in the nutshell is um, that the passage of time is present only at the level uh, of our con complex concepts. Somewhere lower down, remember, we have this uh, detachment from events and uh, acceptance of events to a degree. The flow of time is the human attitude to events and states, uh, as I explained earlier, but this is an emergent property. It emerges at some higher conceptual level this is not really um, bricks and mortar of what time is. Um, and so time, uh, this epistemic time, time in our thoughts comes um, from um, uh, these um, model blocks um, because they com these units combine to give you this experience of flow. Uh, the flow comes from the arrangement of the atoms. Okay, but this is not the whole story, because asking does time flow, or why does time appear to flow, is really posing a rather naive question in uh, 2019. And somewhat like, does space flow, or what, why does space appear to flow, but it doesn't, it's not normally seen as naive, only because the conceptualization of time as flowing is just so much more natural, so much more entrenched, because we are running our uh, life cycle uh, and the comprehension of the scientific facts of the dimension, time as a dimension is just so much harder. Um, here, uh, philosophers of physics, Jenna Ismail, an American philosopher, she wrote, she wrote a book, How Physics Makes Us Free, really a brilliant book, says that uh, this time as flow just em emerges, but it's absolutely compatible with physicists' time that doesn't flow. It's just our, uh, com the perspective that complex systems like us impose on uh, reality. But what exactly does it mean that the scientific conception of space-time has percolated to our common knowledge to a sufficient degree? We learn it about it at school, we read in popular science uh, magazines uh, about it, Scientific American, New Scientist, and so on, but what does it really mean? Um, here, I think anthropologists come with some help. I looked at the work uh, of a French anthropologist, Dan Sperber, uh, who talks about so-called semi-propositional representational beliefs. So we believe some facts, we believe facts, we have factual beliefs, but we also believe representations 
of facts. Uh, some beliefs are propositional because we fully understand them. Others are so-called semi-propositional because we don't fully understand them. Here the example he gives uh, is uh, he, he went to Ethiopia, spoke to a tribesman in Ethiopia. Tribesman tells him there is a dragon in the forest. The dragon has a golden heart. Go and kill the dragon. And Sperber replies, but I don't have a gun. And then he wondered, why did I say that? Why didn't I just say, come on, there are no dragons? And he thinks it's because he tacitly understood that what the tribesman was saying was actually rational, that there is something out there in the woods, there is some danger which the tribesmen couldn't understand, so they, so to speak, put it in quotes in their thoughts, and they conceptualized it as a golden dragon. So it's not really irrational, it's simply semi propositional and representational, not factual. Uh, so this is how he explains uh, uh, cross-cultural differences. And then there is only a short step from there uh, to thinking about uh, scientific knowledge in that way, how it percolates to general population. So we have uh, red giants become white dwarfs. Uh, if you know basic astronomy, uh, then you understand it to a degree. But I probably don't understand it fully. I understand a fair bit about it, but not fully. So that's my semi-propositional belief. Uh, time is just a dimension of static space-time. Again, I believe what theories of physics say, but I don't fully understand it. The universe is governed by symmetrical laws. I think this is even harder because even many physicists don't uh, argue about that. Um, so these are examples of such semi-propositional beliefs, popular representations of a scientific representation of reality. Sperber later on calls it also a meta-representation. We represent a representation to ourselves, so it's a meta-representation. And it's, apparently it's a very important evolutionary uh, achievement that we, that we are capable of uh, doing uh, that. So... To sum up this bit, uh, the representation of time draws on a partial understanding uh, of a theory of, sp of time in space-time. The belief that human time flows arises out of the awareness of the semi-propositional uh, character, and the belief that human time flows will never really become factual uh, because it is founded on this assumed definitional difference between our time as we experience it and um, the real uh, real metaphysical uh, time. So we have this I perspective which gives it asymmetry. The past is the past, the future is the future. It's not just a matter of, the, of where you stand uh, and we have determinism. Um, here are some references. I've actually put references at the end of this talk because I'm going to put this talk on my Academia site on, on Monday. So if you're interested in these, uh, these topics, then you're welcome to, uh, to look at it there and have a look at the references. So in other words, time flows because it flows in my imperfect uh, meta-representation of the uh, static universe. Uh, do I st five minutes? I'll, I think I'll be okay, thank you. Um, so how crucial is this dynamic nature of time to our beliefs about time? How crucial is it that it flows? I was sort of already arguing that it's not so crucial because what it really is on the level of these bricks, the building blocks, is this degree of commitment with which we talk about events. So, and I showed you that in languages without tenses, what matters is again something else, something centered on us rather than where this event is in the past, in the future, and uh, so on. So Simon Prosser again, he says the experience of passing time represents necessary <laughs> falsehood. Time doesn't pass, we get it wrong. I think this is a bit superficial because by allowing ourselves to dig deeper into the properties of temporal concepts, how they are focused on us and this detachment or commitment, um, uh, all the way down to how they are composed, we also shed light on uh, what it is that our experience of time is really experience uh, of. So what I've done here is I moved from concepts to their reflections in languages. Uh, I talked about forms of temporal reference which are employed in natural languages, how they give us a window uh, on the human concept of time. Mm, but we have to remember that they only give us 
a window on online thinking, so on uh, something which um, some linguists call thinking of, for speaking. When we prepare our thoughts to deliver them in a conversation, then we do it on the level of molecules of con concepts, not atoms. So we prepare them for speaking. When you think of what these concepts really are in our thought, then they are different, and they are the same for all languages. You don't have um, this uh, diversity across languages. So the concepts we employ in thinking for speaking are complex uh, concepts, not atomic. Um, now, experiencing for thinking allegedly is the same. When we experience something and then we think about it, then it's also done on that molecular level. And language here interferes. This is a good example uh, from, again, Yucatec Mayan, that uh, language spoken in Central America, where when Speakers of that language look at a mineral water bottle, they will say plastic, we'll say bottle. When they look at a plank of wood, they'll say wood, we'll say plank. When they look at a pancake, they'll say mace, we'll say pancake, because they conceptualize by the substance, not by the function. So languages will have words which will be based on different ways of thinking about reality, but that's only on the level of these molecules. On the level of atoms, we are all the same, we all have the same um, mental architecture. This is what we call neo warfinism So we have the surface uh, cross-linguistic variation, uh, but on the level of building blocks, we are all uh, the same. So the complex concept of time appears as an emergent property. What I'm arguing here, that time as flowing and time as the past, the present and the future, is precisely uh, this molecular concept, but on the level of atoms, we have these degrees of uh, commitment uh, or detachment. It's an emergent property on the higher molecular level of human concepts. Now, events, this is just to sum up, events can be understood or remembered uh, to different degrees. This is what I said, uh, or uh, they can be anticipated more or less strongly. Inference about events can be more or less trustworthy. The concept of time uh, here rests on building blocks that mark such degrees uh, of uh, <coughs> commitment. And that pertains all the way across from the past uh, through the present. Uh, to the future, and this is important. Time doesn't flow on the level of these conceptual building blocks, but it flows on the level of the molecular combinations, which, is, uh, which are species-specific human thoughts and their culture and language-specific expressions. That, again, uh, it's not intended to be understood, just to show you that we, in lingu formal linguistics, we are excited by formalizations, so I have uh, some subjective um, Subjective qualifier, objective qualifier over time. Subjective because we know that uh, we can have distortions to our feelings about uh, how quickly something flows. Uh, then objective because we can measure it. This is real time. That all gives us the concept of time. And then altogether, t concept of time is translated as these degrees of acceptability that something is the case, was the case, will be the case. So again, this ego-centered degree of commitment. So this is how I put it in those ovals which you, uh, which you saw before. And this is so because we are these self-governing complex systems, that is humans, uh, who perform uh, this uh, th thoughtful uh, assessment and we bestow time uh, with this dynamic nature higher up, not on the level of what really is there in reality. We do it in thinking for speaking, experiencing for thinking, uh, and uh, it is not really there in the language on the level of those uh, atoms which is almost analogous to experiencing the flow of space when one runs, spins around, or swings on a playground swing, but really knows that it doesn't, doesn't flow. So we are not that, that far off. It's just it's much harder to conceptualize. <laughs> I didn't intend that. It was supposed to be quieter. It was supposed to be drums, but not that loud. So um, uh, just to wake you up. Summing up, um, the flow of time uh, Ex explained here through the emergent ego perspective and the semi-propositional nature of beliefs, that is this partial ignorance, we don't fully understand what physicists tell us, 
and the fact that the concept of time is complex, then human time emerges from the degrees of commitment to those uh, uh, events, uh, and that can um, then uh, be represented differently in different languages, but on the level of the basic <laughs> concepts, thoughts about time don't differ from language to language. Um, on uh, uh, the, the relativity, the difference only arises on the level of complex concepts. So we have static human time, the basic level human time, which is compatible with the time of space-time in the physicist's description of reality. So we have really no mismatches to explain. Time is time as we know it uh, from uh, dimensions of space-time. The rest can be explained uh, through those um, theories of philosophy, anthropology, linguistics, and so forth. That's all. Thank you.